I am a serial entrepreneur. I've actually built a number of companies. I have actually uh, built and sold companies that involve digital watermarking, image compression, high-speed image transmission, image switching, um, satellite transmission systems, uh, fiber optic relay systems, tele digital television studios, uh, granite actually, I had a brief foray into industrial minerals, and then most recently I've built um, two companies, uh, most recently Cybernth LLC, which was sold to Duos Tech Corporation, and that company focused on a series of patents I got around um, how to deal with risk managing a net centric operation. So if you're moving huge amounts of data across a network, what are the risks associated with it? How do you measure it and how do you control those risks? And currently um, I'm now a partner in uh, a Global Strategic Partners, which is a pretty full services, full spectrum uh, solvent company. Um, a lot of high-end guys, interesting folks. And I'm the IT geek among the partners. All the other partners have other specialties, but uh, they decided they wanted to add a partner. And, and they're all Republicans, so I guess I still have some bona fides left. <laughs> I never intended to sort of become a, a spokesmodel for voting integrity. It was not the intent, but um, the core of how I got involved with this is that in 1998, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth digitally, um, there was a company that had another famous documentary called Startup.com was made called GovWorks. And GovWorks had the vision that they were going to raise tons of money and become an all services provider for everything you ever need to build government solutions. The CTO, Greg Carson, was a friend of mine and the chief of operations, Patrick Comer, was a friend of mine. And so they invited me to come and look at the stuff they were working on. And at one of these conferences, and I believe it was November of 98 or just might have been January 99, they had the future of voting as this presentation and they had these touchscreen machines and I just started laughing. I mean, they claimed they were a technology company, but really remember it's 5% product, 95, they had 95% of guys doing a lot of marketing, but they really didn't have much technology, which is why the company blew up. You got to have the 5% before you market it. They just went straight to the marketing. <laughs> um, um, I saw the machine and basically uh, Greg Carson, who very accomplished guy and myself and another guy who was there on his staff, I don't remember his name, we, we hacked into it in less than 20 minutes, we're playing with the results, changed the code around and, and I basically said, this is absurd. I said, you have an unauditable touchscreen system with unauditable code that talks through a bus system that is then communicating to at that time a already out of date in 1998 Windows CE platform which was written basically as an educational simplification Windows platform in the mid 90s. I said, Windows is gonna stop support, Microsoft's gonna stop supporting this. The Georgia ballots this year in 2008 that have now apparently <coughs> lost 20% of the voters' ballots, or who knows what the hell happened in Georgia this year, or I'm swearing again in Brooklyn. That's the same software. It's the same Windows CE and bunk stack. The stack is all the layers of things. Just in 1998, looking at this first, what was then global election systems, which was then later bought by Diebold, which has now been sold by Diebold, that same piece of junk that we hacked into in 20 minutes in 1998 is still being used in numerous states across the country. It's junk. That's what it is. It's junk computers. They're fine if you want to set up, say, um, um, if you had an aquarium and you wanted to have fish appear and have kids identify which fish it is and then you know you wouldn't really care if they hacked and made the goldfish called a prawn and the prawn called the goldfish because who cares if a kid did that those machines should be used for that extremely valuable purposes of children's education in aquariums um, or museums kindergartens but they should not be used for anything integral to national voting Computers are evil, horrific nightmares. They are stupid, stupid, stupid machines that don't understand anything, but they never forget anything, and even worse, they'll do exactly what the programmer tells them to do, but that isn't always obvious to the user. So a person who's a user at the surface level of a keyboard and a computer is having one experience, but deep inside the computer, that computer can be doing a whole lot of things that you don't know about that the programmer told it to do that you may or may not approve of. 
Voting is a very simple process. It is a process of walking up and making a decision between two, three, four candidates or on a number of issues and checking some boxes. That is best dealt with the simplest technology to address it, and that would be paper and a pen. The moment you add any other technology to it, you're instantaneously adding these layers that need expertise. Now, people go, well, you know, we have these very responsible people at boards of elections, and they do. They're as honest as the day is long. Most people work incredibly hard, and most of them maybe, if we're lucky, had one community college computer course, and sometimes they can get Excel to work. That, that's it. That's who they are. And that's fine, which means that they are in charge of making sure these very, very poorly designed machines all work correctly, which is hard enough for them. And then if they're up against a guy like me who could walk in with a thumbstick and in six seconds change the guts of that machine and what it's doing, they don't stand a prayer. They don't. There's sort of a an unfortunate reality that on some of the more fundamentalist Christian components today, and now we're way off computers, but it relates back to what we're doing. They actually don't think it's wrong to lie to the unbelievers as long as you're working toward a greater truth for God. So if they believe that by controlling the vote, they can save the babies by packing the Supreme Court, which I am convinced this is what this all, how this all started. They got the idea of going, we have to get the true believers in office. We can't seem to get them elected. So let's follow Stalin's advice. As Stalin said, you who have the vote have no control. He who controls the vote has all the control, or some approximate translation from Russian. And, um, and so they're like, let's build the vote tabulators. And then they got down the tabulator thing, and they also said, well, what if we could also control the voting machine so that you could erase the ballot? I don't think they initially thought about hacking the touchscreens. They just didn't want to have a paper trail. It's like... The hacking is mostly done at the tabulator level. It's not, you can hack a voting machine, but you got to hack a lot of voting machines to be effective in most cases, because if, if the population is moving in one direction by 2%, you got to figure a way to hack 70, 80, 90 machines, quite a lot minimum, to have an impact. You can do it, but it's a lot of work. But all you do is hack one tabulator at the state level, or four or five tabulators at the county level. Or as, a, as I believed in Ohio, you can, you know, control some number of tabulators from uh, from a man in the middle. Mm -hmm. You want to talk more about man in the middle, please? Sure. Um, there's a lot of ways a computer network can work. Um, should we go to the whiteboard for a second? All right, we're going to go to the whiteboard for a second. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a basic computer network and draw here for a second. We're going to go ahead and first we're going to talk about Nobody likes having their credit card stolen, so I'm going to talk, most of the work that I do is defending your credit card. So if you have a credit card and it wasn't stolen today, you're welcome. So what happens is you have a, called a POS, or a point of sale machine. And that POS basically has a little swipe thing in it, and you come up and you know you swipe your card, and the card goes through, and then you punch in a keypad. Well, then this is hooked by a wire to a cash register and there's a person standing there looking at it, right? So these two things are part of the network. Then this is hooked to a server. Now, there's a bunch of these. So you're there, let's say I'm visiting Walmart that day. I go to Walmart and I'm gonna buy groceries and my other stuff. So I've gone, I pay for my credit card or my debit card, either one, and those are there are two different functions that happen there. And each of these checkout aisles are part of a network, each with their own POS working their way along. But all of them will feed into a central charge recovery computer, or a CSERC, we call it. So there at the store, you've got your central charge. Basically, it takes all the charges in there and batches them together. And as a general rule, they don't settle everything right away. They keep the stuff in there to settle in sort of batches, depending on what bank they're hooked to. Walmart's its own bank. So, but what they do do is they send out these little pulsed requests that then go out to a phone switch. So now I'm down the block somewhere at a phone switch. Now we have a big map of, of the Great Lakes up here. I'm at the local phone switch. Well, that local phone switch then hooks to a bigger phone switch. So now I'm at some giant, I've gone from the PBX. Now I'm at some big phone switch. 
Now this phone switch then eventually goes to a big huge room with a big optical switch. Now I'm at the opto switch and now I'm inside of a fiber optic cable. And there's billions and billions of pieces of data and it eventually goes to another fiber optic cable, then down another PBX and then to another thing. And eventually it finds its way to some box. And that box is the box that has your information about your credit card. And all this happens in a second. So this thing goes bing, 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 bing. Is this person got a real account? Yes. Or, right? Bing, 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 bing. And it goes, credit or charge approved. Right? On average, when you swipe your card in the United States, 36 computers are involved in the process for one credit card swipe. So when people ask me what I you know, do, cause I've had some people recently going, yours is so obsessed with voting. I go, no, actually, I just spend a few hours a month on voting, really. I, generally, every two years in November, I predict how to steal the election. And they laugh, but I'm usually right. This is what I spend my time doing. Because all of these things in between, every single step in this process, I have found thieves in. Every single one. In Phuket, Thailand, we blew out engineers who had an optical switch who were duplicating things. Just last month, we blew out a gang who had put extra circuit boards inside of this to steal them right at a bunch of stores in Belgium and London. A few months before that, we, we blew out a group that had compromised cash registers. We've blown out employees who are copying this data. We've blown out people who are working at the bank who added code to steal it there. It's like... There is no part of this system that we have not found thieves stealing or changing data. None. And it, 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 it amounts to millions of dollars a day that we lose. Now, all around the world, there are thousands of qualified, highly driven, and very good professionals like myself trying really hard to allow your credit card to work. And most days, we win. And occasionally, now, you know, let's go even to the next step, right? So now let's take a, what we do to stop a thief. So if we're trying to stop a thief, so I've made my credit card charge here. And now my credit card charge is traveling through the system, going through 36 computers. That goes very fast here because it's the speed of light. Then we're back into copper here. Now let's all of a sudden, this computer that asks, are you real? Then says, huh. It, and the computer equivalent of huh would be, it asks you real, go, well, that's a real account, but Bob Smith's never been to the Walmart in Oklahoma before. So the huh of the computer then triggers a whole other bunch of computers. And these computers are what I spend most of my time designing. And these are fraud detection computers. So now you've, let's say you live in Long Island. And someone has stolen your credit card and sold it to a guy who's made a white card copy. He's taken an old hotel key like this. This is actually a hotel key that's been converted into a credit card by a thief. So this is called a three-track mag code. And he stole the data, used an encoder that he probably bought on eBay for 50 bucks, and turned what looks like a Hyatt or, you know, Weston key in his pocket. But this is actually a phony credit card now. He's run the phony credit card, we call this a white card fraud, through a machine, hoping to get away with a single charge. Hoping that this computer won't say, huh, but we'll say, eh, you know, okay, that could be risky. If they see two or three huhs in a row, they'll definitely say something. And sometimes on the first huh, they're like, okay, they're, they're, there's something odd going on. The person's on a business trip or something. We won't bother them. The, the computer has to make, the computer doesn't make a decision, but the programmer has to make a decision about this. But if the computer says, huh, then all of a sudden my computers come into play. And my computers then say, what is the person's buying pattern? What is the person's age? Where is this person doing? This is definitely out of program. And then what happens is you're sitting there and your phone rings. You're in Long Island and your phone rings. You go, hello. And there's a nice person on the, on the phone. And by the way, now this data has gone from Oklahoma through to your bank in Long Island into some of one of several farms where our fraud computers are, who've now sent a signal with some of the information to South Dakota. And now we're over in South Dakota at a fraud call center where there's, there's some in Ohio as well. People with nice Midwestern voice gets on the phone and goes, hello, Mr. Smith. 
this is your credit card company. And they, they're not from the credit card company. They're from the fraud outsource company. But they know what credit card is and know what name to say. And they have a script. I said, are you standing in the Walmart in Oklahoma City buying? And if you go, yes, I am. They go, well, that's wonderful. And they click yes. Now a human decision about fraud has been made. And if you go, no, I'm in Long Island, they go, no. And then this cashier then has their manager come over and we try and arrest the guy, right? Who's doing that with voting machines? <laughs> Nobody. If anyone is in this process, and trust me, there are people who wanna be in this process. If anyone's willing to spend a billion dollars on a two-year campaign to win an election, Spending a couple million bucks to intercept the system and change the vote, you bet they're willing to spend a couple million bucks to do it. Nobody's building these kind of systems to protect your vote. Nobody. So what a man in the middle is, is precisely that introduction. That's a white card charge. But these other things I've talked about, let's talk about the, the Phuket blew out we had. So this group in Thailand, very clever, had basically added a computer right here called a mim, a man in the middle, and sometimes they're called kingpins. If they're a kingpin if they also send out controls. They're generally just called a man in the middle if they intercept information. And what happened is they had all of Phuket, where all these people were vacationing, all this information was coming in, and they were basically watching for things that were not cards that they didn't want and not phone calls. This was a very cleverly controlled computer that understood what the transmission signal of a credit card charge looked like and then would copy the whole thing. And then what they would do is every single card that they wanted, they'd add a hundred dollars in charge to a casino, get the chips and then cash the chips out. So then you come back from your vacation, you know, Miss, Mrs. Smith has come back to Long Island and she gets the bill and she goes to Mr. Smith and says, what night did you spend a hundred dollars at the casino? And he goes, I didn't spend $100 in the casino. You must have spent $100 in the casino. Remember this? She goes, I didn't spend $100. I spent $20. And my $20 charge is here. So then it becomes a question, do Mr. and Mrs. Smith want to call anyone and fight about $100 that they had on vacation that neither of them are really sure if they spent it or not? It was a very clever gang. And they were doing it to 50, 60, 70, 80 cards a day. Right? That's a mim. Now... Let's say instead of wanting to intercept credit card charges, I wanted to change a vote. Well then, I just need to figure out, here's my voting machine out there, and my voting machine has got people who drive it to the county tabulators, but I'm going to erase this and now go to an architecture that's closer. Now that you understand the process of how it happens, let's talk about how voting tends to happen. So. We've got all these voting machines out here. This is, this is my polling place. And then the voting machines generally have a human being, not always, but a human being takes them apart and gets a bucket of memory cards, basically. These are my memory cards. And then they physically drive to the county tabulator. And there's basically a series of computers involved now. So at the county, I basically will have a thing. It looks sort of like a printer, but it's got a slot. You stick the card in there. And then there's a, uh, a reader screen, and then there's some kind of transmission computer, which is usually some old Dell computer or something sitting there. Sorry, Dell, if it's not a Dell computer. Well, but it's whatever county computer they could get that's cheap that has the Windows CE system. So this is the first part of my network. And what they do is they put that in, and it reads the thing, and we look at the results, and then it adds it to the total tabulation. Then what happens is it transmits, again, through a local switch into a PBX, into an opto switch, through the optical switch up here and then back out into a PBX and back out into a um, another Dell computer that's at the Secretary of State's office that's the final state tabulation. That's how it happens. Now the question becomes where would you want the MIM? And back now we're going to go specifically October, 2000, October 2004 Ohio. What I have asserted and if people think I'm wrong, great, we'll go to discovery. And, and as I've repeatedly said, if I'm wrong, in my job, I'm wrong 15, 20% of the time. Great, I was wrong. I didn't figure out where the thieves were. I admit it, we move on, we fix it. I'm right about 80% of the time, which is why a lot of companies hire me. What it looks like to me happened, and I said this, was that somebody had installed a kingpin. 
which was taking not just, and now we'll go ahead and change colors here, see if my red pen works today. They were taking a kingpin, and I suggested the kingpin had to be out there. Uh, red's working okay today. So the kingpin, I thought, was probably sitting somewhere in the middle on the high speed line. And the kingpin is a computer with a person sitting at it that doesn't just steal the information and then they use it later like we saw. It's a person who has on board their kingpin computer the code and instructions for the Secretary of State's office and the code and instructions for a county tabulator. Now, as I said, most of these county tabulators, tons of them, are this extremely poorly designed architectures on relatively old software. It's very well established. There's tons of them. I mean, you guys can find lots of examples of people who've shown how to hack the code. but. I'm not talking about the specific hack, I'm talking about the fact this guy has got copies of the code or has already introduced in these things routines that are communication routines to talk to his kingpin. So then what he does is he sits there and instead of this happening, this happens. And in addition to that data flow going through there, the control information in red to go back to these can be driven as well. So now what happens is county tabulates everything up, is constantly talking back and forth saying, I've got 10% of my vote. And the kingpin says, wonderful, what's the total? Now, you think you're talking to the secretary of state, but you're not, you're talking to the kingpin. And then you say, it's this, and the kingpin says, mm, okay, great. And then it passes out to the secretary of state. So, the kingpin doesn't have to make itself seen. It can choose to pass everything through until it decides to say, ah, now I've got a problem. You know, so at nine o'clock in the evening, Carrie's leading in Ohio. And then the kingpin is watching these results go through. And this operator is sitting here at a company called Smart Tech Solutions. We now know. And, and remember, when I speculated this, everyone said, that's ridiculous, that's completely impossible. Well, we now found out that not only was I right, we know where it was sent. We didn't just have it introduced, it was designed into the Secretary of State's office that they could switch the control from their computer talking to the counties to have a smart tech do it. So, great, I was right. So now, everybody's saying, well, yeah, you were right, we're sending a smart tech, but they didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> well, then why were you sending it to them? So these guys at Smart Tech, they're now looking at the things going by and they finally make a decision. We need more Bush votes. So what they started doing was in counties where they already knew that it was a Republican county coordinator, they already knew they were going to win the county, they started padding the vote to cover the differences in the place that had been too dangerous and they would have gotten caught had they done it. So in these places, they were already heavily Republican. They'd probably looked and said, okay, votes have come in from this precinct and we'll take away 50 carry votes and add 50 to Bush and then send it on. And then what's great is we'll then send back to the tabulator and change the tabulator level too, which is very simple to do. If you've ever called up the customer service help desk and all of a sudden watch them changing something inside your computer, you'll go, oh my gosh, how are they doing that? Well, it's because they have the ability to do it if you have the code of what's at both end, which we know the guys at Smart Tech had. So that's how I have repeatedly, first I speculated that's what it was, and then it was discovered in fact that this actual centerpiece existed, and then we found out who owned it, and then we also found out it's also doing Carl Rove's email. <laughs> like, that's brilliant. I mean, it's like, I'm humbled that that was that obvious. So, and of course now we'll find out as the uh, case moves along whether or not anyone wants to do anything about it. But, you know, when you're working on a criminal case, and, I, and I've worked on tons of criminal cases, do the criminals have the means? Do they have a method? Do they have the motivation? Well, motivation, hmm, I want to steal the presidency because it's really powerful position, got it. Do I have the method. Well, this was the method I speculated existed when it happened and everyone said I was out of my mind. Well, we now have all the documentation to prove, yes, actually, the method was set up. And then did they have the means? 
As it turns out, at 9.32 in the evening on Election Day, October 2004, every county stopped reporting directly to Secretary of State and sent everything to this kingpin. And the kingpin then decided what was sent in each direction. Bang. In my world of credit cards, which is where I make my living, if I had speculated about this and even had one tiny shred of evidence, sitting across from me would not be fine people like yourself who are documentary filmmakers. I'd have Secret Service and FBI lined up saying, how do we go get them? Because they all get feathers in their caps and get prizes and win. Instead, uh, there seems to be a deafening silence from the Department of Justice on these issues. But mm -hmm. uh, they're busy. They're very busy. They're hunting down all kinds of uh, child pornographers. And I mean, there's a lot of other people out there that are bad people. So this is just a low priority. I mean, it's just a democracy, so it's not particularly high priority. Well, so what, what do you think happened? In I shouldn't be so flippant, but after 10 years, you get a little flippant about it. I'm really actually quite tired of this entire issue. While there's a lot of people that are kind of cranks arguing about vote fraud, it's like, all I do is electronic security work. And, and it just so happens that in 2003, um, I was asked to be the uh, first day, I wasn't initially asked to be the chair, but I was asked to serve on the National Electronic Commerce Coordinating Commission Task Force for state information exchange for state financial exchanges. And this was paid for by the secretaries of states of the United States. They got together and said, if you're gonna buy a fishing license online, or if you're gonna pay your parking tickets online, a lot of things you can do now, what standards should we have for security to deal with those transmissions? So I was on the task force that's designing this, and then the, the chairman had some personal issues come up, so they then asked me to chair it. So I became the chair who was setting these standards. So in middle of 2004, we finished these standards and they're available on the web at the NEC3 site. You can go look at them and you know, there's what the task force did and our recommendations and, and it's great. So then an attorney general goes, okay, we'll follow these standards and they put that in their contracting and they hold their contractors to it so that they, so you can buy your fishing license online. No voting system passes the standards we set for buying fishing licenses, none, <laughs> not one. And then what's even funnier is, that year, the, uh, the NECCC Secretary of State's conference was in Boston, and Ken Blackwell was there, and I was giving the keynote <laughs> on electronic financial exchange security based on the report we were then turning in them. So I did a big PowerPoint presentation about the report, and, I was like, and Blackwell is there, and at the end of this thing, right, it's like, you know, people exchange business cards, and Mr. Blackwell would like to talk to you about voting security in Ohio, and he goes, this is not the time or place, and I said, if the National Conference of the Secretary of State's Assembly on Electronic Security, with the chairman you hired to work on it, is not the time and place to discuss this, where is? And he turned around and walked away. Wouldn't even broach it. Interesting. And, and I've told this story to people and they're like, oh really? I go, yeah. I mean, it was, it was the two of us right there. He was shaking hands and working the crowd and doing his thing. and But it's like, this is a conference to address these issues, and certainly you trusted me to figure out how to pay for Ohio State fishing licenses. So, like, and I'd like to point out voting machines don't meet the standards of a fishing license. Or a casino. Or a bank. Certainly they're nowhere near what we do. Credit cards were hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of man hours per day in labor, effort, computational systems, analytics, bays nets, heuristic diagrams, I mean, we do stuff that, none of that exists in voting fraud. If someone said to me, Spoon, you have $35 million and a full year to protect the electronic vote in Ohio, which is about what it would take every time, every year, I would say, well, my margin of error will still be one half of 1%. And that's doing everything that I can to fix it. That sucks for a vote because lots of elections, uh, ask Al Franken, come down to, or ask Norm Coleman, either of them, or ask Saxby Chambliss today. Votes come down to less than one half of 1% a lot. That is the best you could hope for with a well-defended network, which we do not have. So as a consequence, 
we end up in a fundamental trap. And, and, and I should really frame the fundamental trap that's so important. In network, the fundamental trap in network systems is you can either have security or you can have anonymity. You can never have both. Now, if you look at the credit card example I showed, the reason we can stop the fraud is we know who you are and who you're supposed to be. And if we need to, we can call you. So if someone takes your information and changes it, we can go back to you as the authority and say, is this correct? And you go, no, arrest them. And I go, great, we're going to go get them. With a vote, we don't know who you are. It's anonymous. So if someone changes it, we don't know whose vote they've changed and we can't go back and ask. And the problem with data is data security depends on digital authentication and identity confirmation. So I can confirm that you are who you say you are. I can confirm that the machine is authorized to be making a transaction by the correct course. And then I can, with some degree of assurance, plus or minus 25 basis points now, make sure that it works. In the case of a vote, I don't have authentication and I don't have identity. So all I got is a bucket of numbers and I don't know where they came from and anybody could change them and nobody would know. Especially if you have a man in the middle who's talking to both ends of the computers, you can make it say anything you want. The one thing you have to confirm against are exit polls. And it, it's not a theory that a foreign government can hack our IT systems. I have personally worked on hacks at the Commerce Department, at the DOD, attacks on the Secret Service, attacks on the intelligence community, attacks on more than 20 of my banking clients, all from foreign national parties. And guess what? Sometimes they got in. And that's been in the press. Voting machines are horribly unsecure. Could China decide a US presidential election? Absolutely. Could Israel? Absolutely. Could Romania? Absolutely. Could a really good gang of Brazilian high school kids? Absolutely. That's how easy it is. Should the GOP take precedence over my nation? No. Should they take precedence over my family? No. Should they take precedence over my religious beliefs in my church? No. Do they take precedence over the Constitution? They're not even mentioned in the Constitution. It's like those are the things that should come first. And if they are not coming first, and in not coming first, we are choosing to compromise our vote. I mean, most of the Constitution actually talks about how you run an election. If you actually read it, it assigns the positions and then assigns how they're elected in enormous detail. It spends more time on that than anything else. It, it, whether or not you like the solution electoral college, it, it thought it through and it created this system to say, we don't know what decisions you're gonna make, but let's make sure that we're all in agreement on how we're going to make it and that we all believe it. We don't want another dictator. We don't want a king. We want to have a democracy. And I'm more than happy to spend my time and money and reputation, which I certainly have spent a lot of each on this issue.